I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is Tech Central's TCS Plus. Welcome to the show. You can subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash techcentral, or in your favorite podcasting app, just search for Tech Central, one word, in any of those apps to subscribe to our shows. Now, we're going to be talking security and cybersecurity next with NEC Exxon. Um, they've actually, in the last few months, I believe, gone toe-to-toe, or should I say keyboard-to-keyboard, keyboard, with uh, a bunch of cyber criminals, as uh, ransomware attackers, I believe. And we're going to talk about that in some detail and, and exactly how that engagement went. I'm, I'm fascinated to hear those stories. But before I do that, let me introduce my guest in the studio from NEC Exxon, and that's Armand Kruger. He's head of cybersecurity at the company. Armand, Armand welcome, and uh, thanks for making the time yeah, to talk to Tech sure. Central. Sure. Great. Um, I think everyone's heard of NEC Corporation of Japan. Um, this was a, NEC Exxon is a subsidiary of, of, of NEC. But just as a recap, uh, just remind me who NEC is, what they do, and uh, the scale of the operation here in South Africa. Yeah, so, I mean, NEC was like this Japanese-born mm-hmm. organization, quite big. 1899 actually is when they started. Uh, it actually stands for Nippon Electric Company. A lot of people okay. don't actually know what NEC stands for. Even when I started, I didn't know. But I did I not know that. learn it quite mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and like I said, Exxon was, was a regional company, NEC Japanese firm bought over Exxon, which is a, a pan-leading African organization that specializes in ICT solutions. So networking, communication, infrastructure, security, mm-hmm. communications, you know, all, the, all that sort of stuff. We've got regional headquarters in South Africa, East and you know, South Africa, obviously, and West. And um, I think we, we typically look after Africa for NEC's perspective. Yeah. So when we trade typically outside of South Africa, it's NEC Africa. But obviously, we kept the local name due Exxon. to- Exxon, you yeah. know, due to local relations and uh, South African regulations. Okay, and that name is, it's, it's a brand that's established it's, in It's the, just the established brand, yeah. In, in the local market. In so, local so market. who was Exxon? When did this acquisition by it, NEC happen? Well, it's a systems integrator. So it's okay. actually a systems integrator and, you know, they were doing typically what they do now. We just wasn't backed really by a global corporation, so right. just NEC from Japan. So it's it remained a systems integrator. Um, I think the acquisition started in 2016, and I think it was finalized, if I'm correct, 2019, 2020-ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that but gave it, it takes usually time with these acquisitions, yeah. uh, especially from a Japanese company, to, to learn the local market, the culture. Yeah. And so now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, so um, the Exxon name, does that stay permanently, or is, is, does it so become far, NEC yes, at some so point? So okay. far, yes, but okay. uh, we'll see when, when the trademark comes to its point, mm-hmm. what you know, the leadership would yeah. decide around that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So security is, is one of the uh, solution areas within the NEC Exxon business. Yeah, we actually, we started the cyber security business unit about six, seven years ago. So okay. it was quite new, good new for Africa. So NEC had uh, cyber security centers all around the world, Australia, Singapore, Japan, obviously, yeah. presence in Denmark, in, in, in Europe, but not really in Africa presence. And uh, I came over from a previous company and we started actually the cyber security business units for Africa, mm-hmm. which is something Japan wanted really hard to do is push the cyber security into the African footprint. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So take, take me through that business. Um, how yeah. big is it here in South Africa? Um, do you have uh, specific focus areas? Do you work with specific industries? Yeah, look, we, we, we started quite small, but yeah. I mean, we've expanded quite a lot. We're quite mature now. I think we're about 36 individuals at the moment okay. within the cyber security business unit. It, it, it's a blend between cybersecurity architecture, managed detection, response people, threat hunters, you know, your typical ethical hackers you would see, sales individuals, project administrators. Um, so, But we, we, we expand it quite a lot. We mm-hmm. do quite a lot of services. But we try to, to stay ahead of the trend, see what's new. All cybersecurity business units, you know, organizations do that. They, there's new solutions. You'll probably saw an hour of Tech Central and everything with this new acronym. Mm-hmm. Every day you need to learn in the IT industry. Yes. Uh, we need to keep up with that. The adversaries are adapting. So, you know, we, we do quite a lot of cybersecurity, but we try to stay focused. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the goals NEC Exxon is very specific about in cybersecurity is establishing a very good relationship with our customers, mm-hmm. but actually understanding what cyber challenges they do have not just selling the kit, but actually helping them on a journey to zero trust. I imagine a lot of these conversations start there with a company that has just been compromised. They phone you up in a flat panic and say, uh, guys, I think we need to start thinking about cybersecurity because we've just been breached. Is, is, that, is, that, uh, is that often how, how these conversations start? It is quite a lot. Mm-hmm. In, in, in the cybersecurity community, there's a lot of talk about when is cyber going to sit at the table? Yeah. You know, when is the CISO, head of cybersecurity, going to sit at the executive table? It's, we always discuss around it because typically you get budget after you've been breached. Yeah. 
that's typically how it goes at the moment, which is obviously not exactly where we actually want it to be. Mm -hmm. The problem is cybersecurity and IT is seen as typically the chef mm -hmm. in the restaurant. He only gets called out or the IT man or the, the restaurant manager. He only gets called out with something wrong with the food or there's something good with the food, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, I get we do get a lot of calls like that. It does change, but I don't think the industry is mature yet enough. I think the industry cybersecurity, specifically South Africa, yeah. Very reactive in nature. Very, very reactive in nature. And I think that's something that we, NECX on slowly wants to start changing. More so than other markets. I think more so than other markets. I think especially if you look at North America, for example, mm -hmm. they are talking about cyber anticipation, you know, cyber breach anticipation, yeah. cyber threat anticipation. If it's a reality or not, it, it's in the consciousness. Yeah. It tells me that they're on a journey, the mindset is correct. And I think South Africa, especially the African market, not there yet. Yeah. But I think that's why NECX one is here actually to help Africa on the journey, mm -hmm. you know, to reach actually those heights. So when you get that panicked phone call, uh, are, you, are you typically able to help or is it uh, more of a, I mean, what, what, do you have those sort of reactive services where you can go in and help fight the bad it, guys? It, it depends on when the call is. If it's a Friday at five o'clock, I go, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not again. Um, I think at the point for we are, it's not mm. really panic anymore. Yeah. It's okay, it's happening now. You know, how far is it? What can we actually do to help assist? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of company are you? What industry you are? And, and what are your symptoms? You know, mm -hmm. a lot of customers will call and say, I've been hacked. It means a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the symptoms? Like a doctor, what's wrong with you? My, my head's sore. Okay, tell me a little bit more. What, what else? You know, have, you, have you been sleeping? And they ca can't actually always answer the questions, right? Which tells me around the maturity of the customer. So mm -hmm. typically, we would call what we call a war room. We'll book an instant response call. The customer will get on the call, and we will assess the situation for the customer. Mm -hmm. We will we will ask the questions, and if the technical guy is on the call, and then based on that, we actually have some form of direction. What's happening with the customer? What's the type of adversary in this customer? And how can we mitigate and you know do a search and destroy operation? So there's a playbook you work to. It's a playbook, mm -hmm. but it's a very versatile playbook because it depends on the adversary. It depends on how far they in the environment. Depends on what the objectives are, which we don't know. Yeah. It's a very blinded kind of situation that we jump into. Yeah. Um, the customer's panicked. We're not panicked. But sometimes we, we panic on behalf of the customer <laughs> because if I hear the customer's voice, I, I, I feel for him. Yeah. Uh, and I know what needs to be done at this moment. I suppose empathy is a big part of this job. <laughs> empathy is quite big. <laughs> you look, uh, if it, like I said, customers tell me we've been hacked and then I can assist this mm -hmm. situation. If they call me and they say, I've got a ransomware note. There's nothing I can do. The bomb went off. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I think that's where a little bit of empathy co comes in. It's mm. a, you know, maybe if you called earlier, we could have assisted you. Maybe if you listened to this IT manager or this person, it could have been prevented. But the base that we can do is assess the situation yeah. currently at that point in time and see what we can actually do to help the customer. But prevention definitely better than cure. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> we sick, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Interesting. So let, let's talk a bit about the actual engagements you've had with some of these cyber crooks. Um, were these um, all around ransomware, or were they around a, a range? I, pres I presume it's typically in ransomware typically situations ransomware. where you have negotiations with yeah. these people. Uh, to take us through uh, a few examples of, of some of these engagements you've been involved so in I, and what I, happened. I think what's very key in, in what we've, the industry, we really want the industry to realize is the mentality of these people. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I grew up, it was hacker in a hoodie. And that was what a hacker was seen. You'd be dealing with business people, right? We're dealing with people that are-, are It's organized looking, crime. It's organized crime. And we actually call them cyber cartels. Mm -hmm. It's like a mafia, mm -hmm. but digital. But they've got a very interesting, so there's two sides to them. It's how they operate and it's how they think from a philosophy perspective. They've got a very interesting thing in, in the cybersecurity community. Called, they call it the hacker mindset. Yeah, Hacking in, in its fundamental form is essentially just an artful form of intelligent expression. It's all hacking. Is. It, it solves complex problems. Problems. Say it again, an artful form. form of intelligent expression. Mm -hmm. That's essentially all what hacking is, right? It, it, it solves via simplicity, very ambiguous problems. You know, I mean, if you think about life, you've got life hacks. You've got a diet hack. You've got a gym hack. It's, it's finding a way to accomplish the same goal, but from a much easier perspective, mm -hmm. where there's less any form of resistance. And they've got this trait. And if you look at America, a lot of people in Silicon Valley... They think like that. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, 
even Facebook says one hack away. Yes. Um, that's how they think. And what these ransomware guys did is they, ob- I think they observed that and they kind of adapted this mentality of how they would break into systems. Now, if you look at these adversaries, they, they're quite interesting. So a lot of them reside in Russia, mm-hmm. but they're all around the world. But a lot of the big ones typically reside in Russia. Why is that? I think they're protected. I think they're quite protected because there's ongoing war between the West yeah. and Russia. And, and it's been ongoing f- since the Soviet collapse. Yeah. Right? But now with sanctions at the Ukraine war, they're even more protected. Mm. Right? So they just reside. There's actually a ransom operator. The FBI knows about him. They posted him in the FBI most wanted list. But what he did was he actually went online to the FBI's website. Okay. And he printed his own most wanted poster. <laughs> right? That's on the website. He put it on a t-shirt and he's selling it in Russia <laughs> because he's a celebrity. Right. right? And he even made a comment. He, he tagged the FBI in his Twitter post or X and said, look, you will fully understand if the FBI is not going to pay him for free marketing due to the sanctions. So they're very interesting people, right? They're quite arrogant, yeah. but they see themselves as rock stars. Right? They, they live free. I'm sure some of these guys are being paid by the Russian government for No, that's services. an interesting one. Yeah. So there's other ransomware yeah. operator that is well known with big ransomware groups and he drives a Lamborghini, <laughs> right? And his number plate is quite interesting. Also Russian. Yeah, Russian. Mm-hmm. It says thief. Thief. Right? That's his number. I'm proud of this work. And he's, he's driving around. He's posting all the stuff online. He actually married a, a lady whose father was like deputy head of the FSB intelligence. So, it's, you know, the, the, if, if you think about Russia as a government, I mean, you, you might not fund them, but they're doing you a favor. Yeah. All they're doing is they're not attacking, attacking any form of Russian infrastructure. They're just attacking things outside of the Russian infrastructure. Right, right. But I think it paints the mentality of, because the mentality, especially for ransomware operators, understanding the state of ransomware is extremely important mm-hmm. to know how they think and how they adapt because businesses need to kind of ad, uh, you know, ad, adapt to that. Mm. And I used a, a very, I actually spoke with an executive a while ago and, I, and he asked me, I want to explain this hacker mindset. Like I, I see it visually, but how do you, how do I, how can I explain it to someone? Mm. And it was a long story. It was, it's a wisdom-based story, but I think it clearly finds this mindset, which is quite unique. Mm-hmm. And it's very characteristic-driven. Three brothers robbed a bank and they stole a bunch of cash. They threw it out on the, the hotel floor and they, they, they looked at it and they were amazed how much money we have. And all the brothers said, well, how much money do we have? And the middle brother said, but let's count it. I mean, that's the logical thing. Let's count it. And all the brothers says, it's going to take us weeks mm-hmm. to count all this money. And the younger brother, just standing in a corner, you know, having the hacker mindset, simply said a very simple sentence that shocked everybody, but I think it explains it. Mm-hmm. She said, why do you want to count it? They are going to tell us tomorrow on the news <laughs> how much money we stole. <laughs> because they're most likely going to say $5 million stolen from Bank X. So why do you want to count? Let them count. Right? <laughs> Work smart. And that's that hacker mindset. It's, it's quite unique. And they've, they're leveraging this when they breach, particularly organizations. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, like I said, how they operate. And, and I think that paints the picture who's the adversary. Yeah. And I think that is a very vital thing. We need to know who we're dealing with. It's mm. not a hacker in a hoodie. It's business people. They see and that person you deal with, that hacker that you deal with whoever it is at the other end of the keyboard is probably not the boss. No. So how do typically operate mm-hmm. from an organizational perspective? It sounds quite weird because we, we're building an organogram yeah. of a criminal. It's a mafia. Or, uh, like a, setup, like a right? cartel, right? Yeah. I said, it's literally how it is. So I have what's called affiliates. Mm-hmm. So there you have a model what's called the ransomware as a service. So the, the boss sits somewhere. He develops the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. He does the marketing. He does the organizational vision and strategy which sounds quite weird but yeah. they actually do that yeah. and they get affiliates and affiliates typically would hack into organizations from a hands-on keyboard perspective breach the organization steal their data and actually ransom the company and they go back to the boss or this the line of communication they currently actually have mm. and say we've got a new victim here's the money and the ransomware boss takes 50 percent and the affiliate gets 70 percent do the guys actually doing the hacking know who the boss is or is that all masked mm. They claim they don't, okay. but I think it's room for debate around that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of them might say they don't, but they are actually the boss, but it's, oh. it's a method of deception. I think that's it's quite 
right something to think of and typically when you see the, on the news you see the videos and they see how they rob yeah uh, or they actually catch these ransomware groups yeah. it's typically the affiliates it's mm -hmm. not the boss you know they get found 20 cell phones some cards piles of cash which is quite interesting because it, it goes into the money laundering uh, oh. you know industry which definitely it's it's some um, Beast on its, it's own. a mafia, so it's probably linked to all sorts of it's, other things, drug dealing. It's, and it's very linked to physical crime yeah. as well, right? Because murder. I'm a digital criminal, yeah. but I've heard someone knows how to get cash. So I give him the Bitcoin, he keeps 50% of it, and mm. he says, there's the location, there's a couple of bags, pick it up, don't ask me where I get it, just take, take it and go. Mm. And it's, like, it's, it's very interesting, it's very entangled. And I think authorities are having a bit of a problem untangling this because it's such a fast growing it's probably growing faster than silicon startups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which says a lot and and in south africa where we know law enforcement is not as strong as it is in europe and the u.s um are we starting to see these gangs emerge locally or is it still very much a russian thing i, I think it's 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 still global okay. i don't think the the operators itself reside in south africa but what we do see what we have observed before we have what's called initial access brokers so it's part of the digital ransomware economy, right. the ecosystem. They typically do like phishing campaigns with the intent of gathering credentials. And they are actually selling those credentials. Like you go and take a lot and you say, add to cart for my new TV. Right. People out there go add to cart for credentials. Right. It, it's, it, there's actually called something called credential trading. Right. Buying passwords, buying IDs. You can IDs. Au auction it. Yeah. Right? And I think it depends on an type of organization. And... Uh, NEC Exxon and Bo, what we have observed before, I think we have probably good suspicion that there's a lot of initial access brokers in South Africa. A lot of what, sorry? Initial access brokers that okay. are part of this digital economy. Okay. And ransom affiliates and groups typically buy the credentials from them because they already did the groundwork. Mm. I just buy the credentials and infiltrate the organization. I make money. I go on with life. I mm -hmm. think South Africa has quite a few initial access brokers. I'm not certain about ransom operators could be, mm -hmm. but not from what we and NEC Exxon and myself have seen. What, what's the reason for that? Is it because um, because in Russia there are so many programmers and people who've been educated in that field and go into that as a career versus a country like South Africa? I think it sparks interesting conversation around that. Um, we don't really know. Like I said, mm -hmm. it's, it's Iran, it's Russia, it's China. There's a lot of big... China as well. And, and, and I mean, sanctions are protecting them, right? How often is it state-sponsored? Debatable, but I think a few. I think there's a few. I think if you look like the colonial pipeline, yeah, it was in America. I mean, they paid five, six million dollars. They had no choice to pay. Mm -hmm. Fuel stops in, into the country, and I think what probably happened is I think the ransom operators. If if, if I was a ransom operator, it is definitely not something I would ransom mm. because the amount of attention it's going to draw mm -hmm. and multi, and the the negative the, the side effect of that was all these agencies, CIA, FBI, they never worked together, but they actually work together now. I mean, that is a side effect. Did they nail the guys behind there? They did, they did catch them. Oh, did they? So okay. with a lot of pressure on, on, on Putin, yeah. before the, the Ukraine conflict with mm -hmm. Russia, they actually caught them in Russia and they found oh. millions of dollars. Oh, but wow. then again, after they caught them, there was nothing heard of them ever again. Okay. So were they really So either they blew up in a helicopter crash or they or, just, or they, they they just they died somewhere or right, they just disappeared um, <laughs> from, from the earth or they were employed. And maybe By the Russian state. Maybe getting funded to say continue what you're doing. Mm. Because I mean if you're a Russian government and you propaganda is your main priority, yeah. I think you could use people like that currently. Yeah. Yeah. For the current state of the world. So you've actually engaged with these ransomware attackers. What what I mean, what, what do you advise companies that have been the victim of a ransomware attack to do? Um, is does it ever make sense to actually pay the ransom to yeah. get your data unlocked? And and if you do what chances are of your, of your data actually, you actually getting the, the password or the key mm. to unlock that data? I think a lot of businesses are still in the blur around ransomware. So they don't have a formal policy in yeah, place to I, deal and, with And I think what the big problem with organizations is ransomware is the piece of malware that encrypts your files. Yeah. But it doesn't infiltrate the organization. Yeah. Right? Threat actors, ransomware operators, ransomware affiliates breach your network. Yeah. So you typically read an article today company was ransomed right but they've been in it for six months mm. okay but but th th that's the problem mm. that that's the problem like you woke up and you saw a ransom window that's the impact yeah. of the bullet that was already fired from the gun yeah. how did the gun get in there right a lot of companies don't focus on that and sometimes it's the first time they know that they actually the first time breached. they know they've been breached yeah. and and that is a big problem mm. 
Because what I've seen happen so far is, and it, it's good because the, the normal reaction from companies is, I need a backup solution. Yeah. I, I may need to backup. That's great. And I fully agree with that. But what about the six months before? Yeah. Right? The ransomware guy didn't care about your backups. He logged in and he, he found your backups. Maybe he neutralized them. Mm. Maybe delete, disabled your security infrastructure and, and controls. And then he ransomed you. And, and you woke up and you realized you were hit on the impact phase, not the breach phase. Mm. So I think companies need to start focusing a lot more on that breach phase, that initial breach phase, not the impact phase, mm. right? You, you see someone on a highway driving recklessly and then, you know, you see him and you just avoid him and he drives into someone and, oh, I didn't see that coming. You, you probably did. Did you see how he, he drove? I mean, you probably saw that's going to happen. So I think companies just need to, to look at that. I think that's quite vital. Yeah, and and have the right, I guess mainly it's mainly software tools that you'd use to detect intrusions and, and report them. So, the so right the, these ransomware guys have a very interesting way of breaching organizations' yeah. defenses. And, and I think the industry is shifting a bit and, and we are trying to shift the industry very hard because the typical conversation today, if, if you walk into a board of directors and there's a CISO, mm -hmm. the typical question being asked is how many vulnerabilities do we have? That's a great question. I don't disagree with it. But it's the wrong question based on how ransom operators observe the mentality, the hacker mindset. We need to start asking questions. If we get breached, where are they going to come from and what can they do? Mm. That question is more, that question creates more of a scenario because the business exec says, oh, but we've got backups. And the IT individual says, oh, you know, well, you know, our, our backup license has expired. So you're actually creating a conversation now just simply because mm. you asked the right question. Because a big misconception I've seen so sometimes is there's vulnerabilities and there's misconfigurations. And and I think misconfiguration can lead to a vulnerability, but a vulnerability is simply a defect in hardware or software that mm. should not be there. Mm -hmm. Misconfiguration is a defect in a configuration that should be there. The configuration should actually be there. And they typically abuse misconfigurations. And and I think it's it's oh. What's quite interesting is technology has got so advanced. I think we have lost track of what, what we actually had. You know, we had the cyber hygiene, the, you know, the basic controls, and then the hype started. Mm -hmm. And we started investing in technologies. New acronyms were born. New acronyms were born out of the acronyms that were born. <laughs> and, and we're involved in this industry, which is very great. But I, what the ransomware guy is looking at is saying, but your focus is on all these nice controls. I'm going to look for the crack. I'm just going to slip through the crap. Mm. The path of least resistance, that is the philosophy that they live by. I suppose another important question is to, to ask is how, how do I know whether or not they're in my system? That's the big question. Uh, that's, that's, Have they actually that, breached me and I don't know about it? That's the, how, how do you answer that question? Very difficult. And, and I think the problem comes in that there's a couple of stuff. Customers typically don't have, organization don't have visibility. Yeah. Right? But I don't think, that they don't have visibility of their perimeter. Let's create a very simple analogy just to kind of put it into perspective. I'm going to break into your house and I want to steal your TV. I need to get in your yard somewhere, mm. right? I don't teleport in and steal the TV and teleport out. So organizations do have a perimeter. Mm -hmm. So they typically don't know the extent of their perimeter. They don't know the controls in the perimeter and they don't always control their perimeter, which is quite big of a problem. So we typically advise customers, look, reinforce your perimeter, reinforce your perimeter, make it as difficult as possible to actually jump in your yard. Because we know your house is a mess, but you don't have room and kind of room to breathe mm. to fix your house because people keep jumping over your yard. Mm -hmm. Stop them from jumping over the yard and let's have some time strategically and tactically to see what we can do internally to kind of fix it. And look, a lot of companies don't know they've been reached. Typically, there's a lot of controls that can help you detect that, but I think most companies will never know mm that they've been reached until they wake up to the impact phase, which is a ransomware note, or they see someone online telling them, look, someone is selling all your data. And then they typically go on to public relations. We're very sorry. We've heard about these claims that we've been breached. We're doing a full-blown investigation, determine the source, and then eventually they find the source and then they go back and they buy the solution they wanted to buy two years ago or <laughs> implement the, the framework or the strategy that they've been talking about you know, in meetings, but they yeah. haven't actually implemented yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to come back to ransomware and a company get, that's received one of these ransomware notes and now sitting with a, all the company data that's been encrypted and no way of restoring it from a backup. What What is the best practice to case there? What, what do you do? Do you negotiate with these guys? Do you 
pay the ransom if, to get that data back? Do you risk that? Um, mm. I'm guessing it's different on a case by case basis. Very different case by case, but specifically industry. Mm. Who's the customer? What's the industry? So, for example, if you JSC listed, yeah. you have a big risk because if your shares drop, you as the CEO needs to represent the board of directors. And why did the share drop? This is a reputational but risk. But actually, mm. address the JSC. Mm. What happened to your shares? Because you're affecting the co economy yeah. and third party investors that are critical to the economy. It's quite interesting how they operate, like I said, from a negotiation, negotiation perspective. I've, you know, when there was a, a school which we won't name that got hit with, with ransomware. A school. A, a, a school, right? Mm -hmm. By a well known ransomware operator group called Lockbit, which is actually one of the biggest at the moment, which was quite interesting on why they would hit a school, mm. but, but anyway. And they asked for $2 million. And the IT manager, unfortunately, they couldn't recover. They lost all their recovery. And he went on the chat, like he would WhatsApp mm -hmm. someone, and he said, look, we, we don't have $2 million. We've got $200,000, but we don't. that's all we have. That's mm -hmm. all that we can actually give you. Mm -hmm. And the ransomware response was quite interesting. Yeah. He said, no, 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 no. You, you don't fully understand. I worked very hard to break into your network. I deserve my $2 million. <laughs> And you go back and you think about it, it's like, well, are you crazy? You know, <laughs> how can you say such a thing? And and that's the problem is that's how they think. That's how they operate. And we know that. We know that's how they think. We know it's how they operate. So typically when organizations in what we call a post-encrypted phase, right? The nuclear bomb went off, the, the environment's encrypted. Yeah. They've got no backups. We typically always advise customers never ever pay because you're feeding the ecosystem. Yeah. Right. You, we need to neutralize the ecosystem collectively somehow. It must be difficult to make that decision though if you all your data is encrypted and you've got no way of getting it back and it's threatening your business. It's 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 very frightening, especially to executives. Yeah. And and I've seen negotiations where they've got cyber insurance, right? And the ransom operators actually have downloaded their cyber insurance policy. And they said in the chat, we want to talk to the CFO. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, you're not going to talk to a CFO. Why don't we talk to a criminal? We're going to negotiate. You know, they get their lawyers in. And he says, no, it's very simple. This is not the response of the, the ransomware affiliate. I've got your cyber insurance policy. I know how much you're covered for. And you're gonna, probably going to spend a month, two months fighting with the insurer to get your money because you didn't have this control in place. You didn't have this control in place. <laughs> you didn't read the T's and C's. I'll make you a deal. I'll cut your price in half, 50%, but you pay me right now. I'll give you data back. <laughs> Now, you see if, oh, you're thinking, this customer, let's say this actor's asking for $10 million. If I pay him $5 million, he's going to save me right now. And if you do a calculation over two, three months, maybe you lost $20 million mm. as a business risk. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult decision from a CFO. And, and I've sit in these situations where I've sat next to CEOs yeah. and CFOs, and I told them, don't pay. Yeah. And they said to me, why not? It's, it's, it's simple. As, and, and because I don't understand the ecosystem. And I had to brief them, don't feed this ecosystem, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't don't feed it. And they never paid. And we eventually managed to recover the organization for a lot of hard work and participation and hours. But yeah. um, via the rebuild, we actually learned more mm. about how the company actually was operating. And, and we secure. had the opportunity to rebuild it from the ground up. Securely. And securely. Yeah. Which was which is amazing. Which is something that so I think a lot of ransomware operators force organizations that never want to innovate. Yeah, they force them into a corner sometimes, and it actually forces them to innovate. And do these? Um, I mean, how often do these criminals actually decrypt the data once you've paid the ransom? I mean, don't we have cases where you pay over your million dollars or whatever it is, and the hacker just disappears? So they have an interesting tactic called double extortion. They do what's called double extortion. Mm -hmm. So so they will in encrypt you'll pay. Let's say you pay, we don't advise, but you pay. They'll give you your data back. They'll give you the decryptor and your files are operating, your business is operating. Yeah. But they already downloaded your files. They typically come back in six months and says, uh, but uh, you never paid us actually for the data. You paid us to use the data, but we still have your data. <laughs> and they want more money. And they otherwise they leak it. Otherwise they're going to leak it and, or they're going to sell it to different ransomware operators. They're yeah. going to sell it to intellectual property to your competition. Which is very difficult, right? That's why typically when, when we detect human-operated ransomware in a customer's environment, hands-on keyboard activity, we make the assumption data has been stolen, most likely. Mm. You, you, you have to assume You as a company need to assume it and you need to follow the proper procedures to handle that now because it's better if you can come out and say, look, mm. we've been breached, potential data has been stolen. You're probably going to take a hit 
Mm. But you will take a big eight if you ignore it, and eight months later, the ransomware operator comes back mm. and informs you and all your customers that you've actually been hacked. Mm. It's like a hostage situation. It's a, it's a hostage situation. I, I, uh, I remember sitting next to someone on a plane, I think it was a flight back from Europe about 10 years ago, so he was a really interesting guy. He was a hostage negotiating. Oh, works, okay. works for businesses and I think mainly businesses around the world and he gets called in. He was just, just returned from a hostage situation where he is the chief negotiator. He goes in, he works with the family, uh, the friends of the family and, uh, and he sits, he lives with them until that hostage is released. I, I'm just wondering if there's a, um, a career category perhaps emerging in cybersecurity where you have uh, a chief negotiator who comes in and sits between the company and the, and, and the criminals and, and actually has a similar sort of, I mean, it's obviously not people involved, so it's not quite as serious, but it's still a very serious situation. Yeah. Is that a job uh, position that's starting to... There is it's actually a job, but it's on the wrong side of the fence. So ransomware operators are hiring negotiators oh my to grief. negotiate with companies because <laughs> companies don't want to pay. <laughs> so so I know the Rans, it is a, it is a Kira ransomware group is quite well known and there was one called Networker, which is quite well known. Yeah. They actually on their website post jobs. You can earn up to a million dollars a month, <laughs> right? They 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 post that HR positions, developers, and I've seen I've seen nego- negotiator jobs, and actually demand that you've got police experience. Good grief! So who's ahead? We are with them, right? It sparks an interesting conversation, but yeah. it, it shows you the maturity of the ecosystem. Yes, and how they're maturing because obviously they realized, okay, well we have been negotiating with all businesses, they refuse to pay. Because either they, they followed their, their backup strategy, which was quite resilient and robust. Yeah. We, we've got a problem. And it just shows you how they innovate. And they said, well, I'm going to hire a proper ransomware negotiator to negotiate with this business so I can get my money, which is quite interesting. Fascinating. Fascinating. No, it's terrifying. No, it's terrifying. But, but it's, the, it, it's, it's the world we are quite norm to. Mm. Right? So when I typically talk to executives and I tell them about this, they, they're quite shocked. Right? Like, is, is this my adversary? I said, mm. that's exactly your adversary. Yeah. That, that's why you need to think like them, understand how the ecosystem work. And whatever you, you invest in from a s- security perspective, the trajectory of your cyber investment needs to be very core and focused on neutralizing yeah. that ecosystem yes. as much as possible. Amant, before I let you go, uh, let's talk a bit about um, what can be done about this problem, which it, and it seems to me th- through this discussion that it's going to continue getting worse just yep. because there is so much money to be had at the end of the day, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, but what can the IT industry broadly do to perhaps start to address this threat and particularly around ransomware? Mm. Um, is there more that, that, that software companies can do? Is there more that hardware companies can do? And, and uh, companies like NEC, Exxon and, and others in this space, um, what, what do you think? I mean, it's a war going on out there. Yeah, it's a digital battlefield. Do we need to use bigger weapons? Yeah, I think we, we need to get the cavalry, right? So that's <laughs> what we need to do. I think if, if you look at how they operate, powerful fleet systems, right? And, and, and I think what, what or, the biggest problem with organizations, I think there's, it's, it's legacy, if let's take normal things, legacy systems, right? But it's your perimeter as well. <laughs> what are you exposing to your perimeter? You're not going to put your TV at your front gate. Right, you can hide it somewhere around the corner. Even when someone, when you bring in a guest, mm. you should you shouldn't actually see your TV. You should be like around the corner or something, right? So you're doing that segmentation in your house. Think about you as an individual. I think that there's a there's a lot of lack of cyber hygiene that's not being done. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the hype of advanced security solutions that have kind of consumed us. Yes, right. And they do a great job, but they're just plugging holes. Mm. No one's closing the hole, actually, what they're actually supposed to do. I had a very similar question as you asked with, with an IT manager. And we did an assessment on the organization from a threat actor's perspective or a ransomware actor's perspective. So his bird's eye view. It's kind of his owl view that you can see. And we found a system online. And we told the IT manager, look, you've got a system online that is being exposed. It's a database that has confidential information, most likely, and I'm saying most likely because that's what the ransomware guy is going to assume mm. most likely and he's mm-hmm. going to target it. And it's it's an opportunity for him to actually target that system. And the, the IT manager said, well, we don't use it anymore. I said, that's fine, but it doesn't mean it's unusable. Just because you don't use it doesn't mean it's unusable. And that's what the ransomware guy is going to do. He's going, okay, well, I'm just, I'm just going to use it, right? Leak the data and steal it, and it's so opportunistic mm. in, in in such a way. So I think what what we would like to see is cybersecurity and IT coming a lot better together. 
Um, because I think that there's a lot of conversation typically if you if you talk to people about social engineering, you know, user awareness and all that, and that's extremely important. I, I fully support that and I fully agree with that. But threat actors, especially ransom operators, need, need three key things to succeed. They need internal access. They need to be in your network somehow. And that's just the weakest link. That's the weakest link, right? They need credentials. They need identity. Identity is actually the new premise, and identity, is, I think, has always been critical, right? A lot of organizations have what's called active directory, which is like the heart of your body. It, it, it's the main authoritative figure yeah. in your environment that decides are you allowed or you're not allowed. And I think one of the key reasons Ransom is so successful is the weaponization of Active Directory and the growth of the cyber economy, which I think have motivated them quite extensively. And they need privileges. I need to be a privileged user from a technology perspective to succeed. Who's privileged users? IT. Not end users. Mm. IT are privileged users. They target end users to get to privileged users to get to to take over your organization, what we call domain dominance or domain takeover, mm. organizational takeover. But if we can understand they need internal access, they need credentials, and they need privileges, we need to invest our security solutions and our strategies to disrupt all three of those points as much as we actually can. And there's a lot of talk about zero trust. You know, zero trust, everybody has a different definition of zero trust. You know, when I look at it, typically what I see in the field and where I think the industry is going, zero trust for me is simply an architectural state of mind fueled by cyber consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's zero trust. It's a philosophy. It's a culture. It's thing. a culture. It's not a, it's not a solution. It's, it's a philosophy you need to live by mm -hmm. every single day. It's a cybersecurity lifestyle. I trust think no one is what it Trust no says. one, right? Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's some form of cyber consciousness everybody as an individual, as a human, needs to kind of develop. Because typically when you go to an organization talking about zero trust and says, well, I'm going to implement my solution and I don't trust you. And the end user will say, well, you don't trust me, but you pay me. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean you don't trust me? You don't pay my salary. What? So you know, I think culturally we need to change people's perspective. Yeah. And I think you as an employee, people will always hear everybody's cyber security is everybody's responsibility, which is absolutely true. But we need to trigger that cyber consciousness in each employee. For your culture, for your business leaders, for your executives, we need to trigger that somehow. If we're more conscious around what we do day to day, how we think, how we consume data, what we do with it, I think we can actually solve the cyber hygiene problem slowly but surely. And then the advanced security solutions like EDR and XDR actually just reinforces our baseline security. Fascinating. We've got the information regulator, uh, which uh, was, I think, set up or a couple of weeks ago. Working. Yeah, right? Started working a couple of years ago, but they've they've made they've yep. started to take their first administrative actions. I think they're going off to the Department of Justice. Yes, it's going to court now. That's right. uh, and there was there was Diskem and I think one or two other cases that they've been looking at. But in your view, is there any more that regulators and the government can be doing to help protect organisations against cybersecurity attacks? Do we need better legislation? Do we need better regulation? Mm. Um, what can the government do, if anything? It, it, and I like that conversation because for PR came. You know, Section 22 clearly states what yeah. the conditions of a security breach notification are. We do a lot of business, for example, if you do a lot of business in Europe, you've got GDPR. Mm -hmm. Article 33 clearly states what you need to do when you've been breached. I think it's quite new in South Africa. Yeah. It's quite mature. What I've seen so far, I think the fines are too small. I think the fines oh. should, should be a lot bigger. Okay. And, and, uh, because, I mean, if, if I make a you know, billion rand cost of sale turnover and you give me a two million rand fine, because I left the system open, I shouldn't, I'll just probably pay you. Right? It's actually the reputational so. issues when this hits the headlines and you've been hacked. That's, uh, that's, that's actually really damaging. To that's really damaging, yeah. but it's very hard to quantify it. Mm. I think cybersecurity quantification is still a very diffi difficult topic. Yeah. And I think the information regulator, I think the purpose of it should be is, here's what we recommend your best controls should be, mm -hmm. right? From a cyber hygiene baseline perspective, to advanced security solutions based on your business needs, how you generate revenue, what, and what your business gaps, and cybersecurity gaps potentially mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and advise you as best to actually solve those solutions and problems as much as you can. I think the information regulator can do a lot more, but it, it will be, I don't think we'll give it enough chance. I think it's still too mature. It's not mature enough mm -hmm. in South Africa. I mean, so if you look at the States, you know, they've got a lot of, they've got a cybersecurity framework, they've got a strategy. Yeah countrywide strategy to protect, you know, the money of the country, actually, import, exports, yep. geopolitical. I think that's quite fascinating. I think it's too new. But I've, uh, what I, from what I've seen of the DOJ, you know, um, 
this game, for this example, was yeah. Westbridge. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's too light still. Okay. I, I think it's too light. And, and, and one thing I've noticed about South Africa is the community is very, very powerful. And I think if, if the information regulator can set an example mm-hmm. and say, look, this is how it needs to be. We need to take a step. I think it shows progress in terms of South Africa. Yeah. Because we've never had this before. And I mean, the Cyber Security Crimes Act was recently revised, actually. It's quite interesting, the content ar- around. But, but I, I think we need to do a little bit more if we want to protect specifically South Africa, we need to fight these ransomware operators in, in some way. And, and I think the way we fight them, at, like a cartel, I mean, if you look at the mafia, mm. we've got police task force that have been bred and created and crafted to tackle. America is called the DEA, yeah. Drug Enforcement Agency. Yeah. The primary responsibility is drugs, cocaine, stop it, import, export, which the mafia arrest them. M- maybe... It's just a consideration f- from a global perspective. We need to look like a digital task force where we can actually dismantle these ransomware yeah. operators, dis- dis- dismantle the economy. Mm-hmm. Not just the ransomware operator, but the economy, where they actually buy the credentials from and stop it at the root cause. And I think that could potentially also be... But you're going to need some real skills uh, in, you in need whatever some real enforcement skills. agency is. And people who can understand blockchain and crypto yeah. and, and all of the stuff which these hackers use to, yeah. to rip people. South Africa is actually quite rich in talent. Mm. Uh, mm. There's a big difference where I always say between skill and talent. You know, skill is something you can learn, talent is something you're born with. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talented individuals, especially in cyber security, that actually understand ransomware operators and you know the defensive and offensive security side of it. Mm-hmm. And they, they're really trying to, to help co- yeah. companies actually stop it. The big problem that we face currently in cyber security, which is quite controversial depending on who you talk to, but it's globally viewed still, is that a lot of defensive security, what we call the blue team, is very political driven. My vendor is better than yours, my solution is better (laughs) than yours, right? Where the red team, offensive security is all tactical. I want to get in and I'll do everything I can to get in. I don't care what you have, right? And that's why they're succeeding because they've got a very different kind of mindset. Yeah. So I think the information regulator can definitely maybe help with the mentality of businesses, you know, drive the cyber consciousness around the country. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the one way we can dismantle the ecosystem. Plenty of uh, food for thought there. A um, little bit of a terrifying conversation as well. Yep, but uh, but uh, it needs to be. It needs to be. Uh, it's, it's a reality. Yeah. A, a lot of cyber people, you know, live it yeah. every day. They do all these threat actors every day. But I think it's very key that business leaders start realizing it because they've got the authority mm. to, to redirect funds. They've got the authority to make decisions around businesses. I think when a lot of business executives, a lot of them are, but my primary aim is to make them understand this ecosystem mm-hmm. and not to come and sell you a solution, but bring you a strategy, mm-hmm. help you on a journey. And that's perfectly what NEC Exxon is doing is when we go into a company, specifically myself, I look at what gaps do you have and I'll identify what gaps do you have that will that ransomware operators will exploit because that kind of elevates your risk, yeah. right? It's, it's current risk, it's long-term risk, it's reputational risk, it's business risk. Think about the medical industry. It, there's loss of life. There's loss of lives. The insurance are gonna gonna hit the hospital. The, the individuals, personal family members are gonna hit the hospital. I mean, you as a, as, as a hospital brand name is scarred for a very long time, mm-hmm. just because a simple medical equipment had default credentials on it that was never mm-hmm. changed mm-hmm. because it was a nuisance or software that wasn't patched. Software that wasn't patched. Was. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And 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 I think that that that's gonna be definitely key. But I think slowly over time, if we get the executives to to understand it, and I've our executives understand the economy very well. That's why they say just do anything you can to, to, to stop them. Mm-hmm. But but it's it's like protecting the president. If you look at the United States, Secret Service is very fascinating. On look at positionally how they protect the president, the way they walk, the way they look. They've got snipers for long range snipers to kind of protect them. The car is bulletproof. It's tank proof. I don't know what other acronyms it has. There's Secret Service people everywhere. There's undercover Secret people everywhere. Mm-hmm. And the moment someone just steps over a barrier. They neutralize the threat. There's, there's six, seven secret service people all around the guy. They arrest him. They interrogate him for 12 hours. And the guy was probably just looking on Google Maps. He was lost. Oops, I walked the wrong, 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 took the wrong r- step. R- took the wrong <laughs> step. But that sense of urgency. Yeah. Is, it's, and, and the secret service does it very well. And their controls kind of move with the president. Our controls currently is quite static. Mm. We our data is in one place, so mm. we need to be very adaptable around our security posture. Mm-hmm. It needs to be able to move with our data. But I think that sense of urgency 
if if business leaders can adapt that sense of urgency and say, look, we n- we need to stop this. That that's what NEC Excel does. We go to companies. I give them, you know, what the gaps they have. Can it be exploited? What's the business impact you can have? And I try to push that sense of urgency, but also help them to actually close that gaps. I guess, unfortunately, many people only learn after they've unfortunately, unfortunately they've been attacked unfortunately. and successfully and their yes. data locked up. Yeah, and then it's just money everywhere. But and, uh, and but hopefully uh, one or two uh, people uh, watching or listening to this show yep. will, will take your advice and, uh, and start to actually do some proper investigation around the governance of their security. Lots of things to think about there. Amant Kruger is Head of um, Cybersecurity at NEC Exxon. Thank you so much for sharing yep. those fascinating insights with us. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.